Dallas Willard says grace delivers us from earning, not from effort. Self-control is a fruit of the spirit. We have the ability to exercise self-control. Why is it not happening? Lack of effort. Yeah. Proverbs 25, 28 yeah. says, a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. It's a city that could be easily Taken. destroyed by the enemy. And that's the same thing for our spirit because I see too many people that are quitting way too early. And why? It's because they lack the fear of God. God makes this statement, my people are destroyed because they don't know me. But I could just see someone, I don't want to be destroyed because of a lack of knowing God. So if, if you're listening and your cry is to know God, his cry is to know you. No. Yeah. So the fear of the Lord is what, what? Gives you the ability to do the endurance that we just talked about. We were talking about it the other day. What did we say? We said, these are the seven things. These are the seven things that God never wants us to forget. Hey everyone, welcome to the Jump of Your Podcast. And I'm so excited, Arden, to yeah. be able to be joined with you to have a great discussion about how the Word of God applies to us today, because we are in some crazy times right now. Yeah. But and before I, what? what were well, you? I was going to say for the first time, you weren't uncomfortable with saying the intro. I know. I've gotten used to it. So yeah, I can I say the John Bevere podcast cast and not flinch anymore. Exactly. I, but didn't anyway. see you, I didn't see you shudder or anything. <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> yeah. So this is a part of the Messenger International Family of Bod podcasts. And the other one I do quite frequently, of course, is conversations. Yep. That's when Lisa's on the set yep. with me. But this is the John Bevere podcast. <laughs> that's, that's right. I okay. <laughs> and this one, we really want want to talk about how truth applies to the ever-changing times today, yeah. as we've already said. And I just want to remind everybody, man, if, if, you, if you could just rate, review, and even write something about what you're getting out of this broadcast, or maybe something you want to see us talk about, it will help us to be able to really bring a more efficient, uh, more powerful podcast to you because that's who we really want to serve as you, the listener. Now, what we are doing, Arden, is we are walking through the book of Second Peter. All the producers thought we were going to be through it in three programs, all three chapters. We have gone through, I think, four or five programs and haven't even gotten out of chapter one, and yep. we're still in chapter one. Mm -hmm. But this is what we're talking about today. Everybody listen up. What are the seven things that God never wants you to forget? Mm. I mean, that's important. Does it, you got any ideas? No, I don't. You I mean, don't? I, I do because it's in the notes, but like, <laughs> I want to hear from you. I mean, I wonder what everybody, if we're sitting we're here with people, Arden, right now, and we'd say, what are the seven things God never wants yeah. you to forget? I, I mean, wonder what kind of answers we well, get. I, I feel like you would hear like that God's forgiven you. Yep, that's that, good. That his grace like is that. significant or sufficient for you. Yeah. And then that it would be like simple stuff. Like Je you know, man, I'm not Jesus is in. coming back. Jesus is coming back. And that's not simple. Sorry, I don't want to say simple stuff, but it's things that a lot of us know. Like we understand, but yeah, I think what we want to talk about today is things that you don't necessarily correlate to your walk with Christ in the progression that you go through it. Yeah. So in other words, what's keeping you as a baby Christian, yeah. what's keeping you from becoming more like Jesus Christ? Yeah, what's holding you back? Because yeah. that—that that is every yeah. Christian's desire should be that. It's not, I got saved and then I'm good. Like They want to continue to keep pressing forward to the high call that's set before them. And ultimately, I think we can overcomplicate that. You said it, it's becoming more like Jesus. Okay, so I'm going to start where this question is answered, and that's verse 12, 13, and 14 of chapter 1 in Second Peter, okay? Chapter 1, of course. Peter makes this statement, therefore, I will always remind you <laughs> about these things. So remember, what are the seven things that God never wants you to forget? I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. Verse 13, and it is only right that I should keep on reminding you of these things as long as I live. Verse 14, for the Lord Jesus has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life, so I will, now listen to this, work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I'm gone. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I just think this is amazing, Arden. Yeah. Okay, you better three not forget it. times. Yeah. I'm going to make sure you always remember these things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do everything in my power to ensure that you always remember these things. Yeah. And then after I'm dead and gone, once I'm in heaven, it. I'm going to make sure you always remember these things. Yeah. So I would say these seven things are pretty important. Yeah. So let's back it up. 
and let's just do a quick, quick, quick review on what we're talking about, all right? Okay. So we're going to go back. I've got so many notes now. It's crazy, all right? But this, this letter is from Simon Peter, and he says, we have like precious faith, which means our faith is equal. Now, he goes on in verse 2 and says, may God give you more and more grace, which tells us right there that grace is not a one-time thing. Grace can be continually increased in our life. In yeah. fact, that means greatly increased. Mm -hmm. All right? How is grace and peace increased in our life? By knowing God. Okay, knowing God. Mm -hmm. uh, this is going to be the theme really quick that I want to highlight in the beginning of this. Knowing God. Yeah. All right? So <clears throat> this word knowing God is the Greek word epigenesos, which we already said it means coming to know, which means we know somebody through conversation. Yep. It's not something I can learn on my own. It takes me experiencing somebody. It'd yeah. be like me saying, oh, I know I know who, I'm trying to think of somebody that's not controversial right now in our world. <laughs> I know who Patrick Mahomes is. There you go. All he right? might be controversial to some people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he might be. I know about Patrick Mahomes. And sure pa I do. It's a I Patriots know, fan. I know he won a Super Bowl yeah. I, or a couple Super Bowls. I know yeah. he's the quarterback for the Chiefs, right? I know all yeah. that stuff, right? But I don't know him like I know Lisa Bevere. Yeah. Now, the way I know Lisa Bevere, that's Epigenesos. I've been with her for 42 years. Mm -hmm. Our conversation has caused me to know yeah. what her secret inward desires are, where her main interests yeah. are. When I think there's a limit to those two things. Like, so, well, there's a limit to the first one. Like, there's a limit to how much you could look up about Patrick Mahomes. But then when you get into conversations, there's really not a limit. Like, I look at what I, I, well, I mean, obviously, I've been married for six years, so that's not super long. But look at yours and mom's relationships. There's still things that I watch as you guys discover about each other <laughs> through conversations, through, I didn't know that was on your heart. Like, you've been married for, what, 42 years? 43 42 years? years. Yeah, 42, I knew. I was like, it's either 42, we're coming into the 43rd it's year. But there's not a limit to that. And I love that because that's the correlation of our relationship with God. So this is what gives us more and more grace is knowing yeah. God that way. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, the thing that's also quite amazing, this word knowledge in the Greek, it actually is not just intellectual. It's knowledge that results from committed living. Yeah. In other words, me being committed to Lisa opens up Lisa's heart more to me. Mm -hmm. Right. If I wasn't committed to Lisa, if I was committing adultery with several women, I guarantee you, even though I'm technically married, live with her, she wouldn't reveal herself to me. So it speaks of committed living. Yeah. Now, verse 3 is just the mind blower. By his divine power. Now, that would be the grace of God. God has given to us everything, and that means complete totality, everything we need to live a godly life. Mm -hmm. So it's not just saying I'm a Christian, but yet I have a lifestyle that looks just like the world. God's given me through his power. Now, that word power is the Greek word dunamis. We get our English word dynamite from. God's given us that same power, and it's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, exact same power. He's given us the power. So you, you, you don't, don't let it just be a superficial word power. It is power, mm -hmm. God's power that raised Jesus from the dead to live a godly life. I could say that's enough to give me the ability to walk away from the sinful desires of this world that would cause me to be separated from God, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I agree. don't stay away from sin because I want to be a legalist. I stay yeah. away from sin because I love intimacy with God and I don't want to lose that, Yeah. okay? So now, God's given to us everything we need to live a godly life. We have received all this by coming to know him. Here we go again, to know him the one who called us to himself. He wants to be intimate with us. He's more passionate about being intimate with us than we are with him. Now, this divine power gives us the ability to live godly, and we get that as we come to know him. I was reading in the book of Hosea just this week. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> God makes this statement. My people, listen up. If you say I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, if you say you belong, you know, I'm, I, I belong to my creator, my people are destroyed by a lack of, of knowledge. But here's a better translation. My people are destroyed because they don't know me. Mm -hmm. That's the new living translation. My people are destroyed because they don't know me. Yeah. Now, can you hear that as a father who is so burdened for his children. Yeah. Boy, they're getting destroyed by these wicked, evil spirits 
the enemy, and it's all happening because they just don't know me. Yeah. Well, can I and I can I ask this because I'm sure there's a lot of people who are asking this question is I want to know God better, and I think we've talked about this previously. So I mean, maybe you can touch it really quick. But how do you know God better? How do you progress into that? And I know this is part of what we're talking about, but I could just see someone being like, my heart cry is I, I don't want to be destroyed because of a lack of knowing God. But yeah, I've tried in different areas. How do I know God better? Okay, I'll answer that before I do. Yeah. He goes on in verse 3 in Hosea, Oh, that we might know the Lord. So again, it's emphasized. Let us press on to know him. Press on. Mm-hmm. Now, Paul said in Philippians 3, I pray. Forget what's behind, and I press. So we see press in Hosea. We see press with Paul, and both are the same thing. What is the high? I press on to the high calling, Paul said. What is the high calling? That I might know Mm -hmm. him. Okay? So here we go again. It's about knowing God intimately. Correct? So now, God responds in Hosea 6.4 by saying, I want you to show love, not sacrifices. Okay, most people would know that as I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Listen to this. I want you to know me more than I want it, any burnt offerings. Yeah. So here's God's desire. I want to know you. Here's our cry. We want to know you. Mm-hmm. So it's mutual. It's not like one party is saying, you know, I really don't want to know you. So if, if you're listening and your cry is to know God, his cry is to know you. Yeah. All right. Now. In coming to know God, here's here's what we've just said. In coming to know God, we receive divine power, dunamis, that gives us the ability to live a godly life. Okay, so we're going back to your question. I want to know God. How do I know him? So the next verse tells us how to know him. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given to us very great and precious promises. Okay, so wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. He just went from knowing God to what? The great and precious promises. What are those great and precious promises? It is the word of God. It is scripture. It is the Bible. Hmm. And Lisa and I just went to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., and we were overwhelmed by how the Bible has gotten into our hands. The lives that have been sacrificed, the blood that has been shed, the effort that has been exerted. I mean, do you know they used to write one copy of the Bible for a very wealthy person, and it would take years and years and years to get that one copy of the Bible into his hands? Mm-hmm. I mean, when Gutenberg came along and did the press, in the, I think it was the 13th or 14th century, now we've got the Bible yeah. available to us because God gave man the knowledge on how to, to rep, uh, reproduce it in a mass, mass scale. Mm-hmm. And so God's given us these exceeding great and precious promises. Now listen to this. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature. Okay, so the way we come to know God is through these promises. And once we get to know these promises, we take on his divine nature. nature. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh-huh. That, this is getting so good. And we escape the corruption. Now listen to this. The corruption that's in the world through sinful desires. Yeah. So what do sinful desires do to us? They corrupt us. What does the word of God do to us? Yeah. It gives us his nature. So we have a choice every moment of every day. Do I want to go towards corruption or do I want to go towards glory? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Every moment of every day we've got decisions. So now we come to the part of the seven things God never wants us to yeah, forget. I was going to say, you're, you're teasing it on. I mean, you said seven things. We haven't heard them, so I'm ready for them. Okay, you ready? <laughs> yes. Okay, in view of all of this, okay, so Peter says, in view yeah. of all of this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. How do we respond? We respond by faith. We respond by exerting effort, okay? Because listen to the, the, listen to the definition of this. All right, where it says, make every effort to respond to God's promises. I'm going to read right from the Bible commentary. The meaning is clear. Growth in virtue is of utmost importance and deserves utmost effort. Mm -hmm. The verb translated added to, okay, to add to, to add to our faith, right? Or to supplement our faith is far more colorful than the translation might indicate. It notes the expense, the effort involved in this growth in virtue. 
We don't automatically become more virtuous as if God infuses virtue into us intravenously. We need to make plans and expend effort. Now, this yeah. is where the controversy comes up. Yeah. Because people go, wait a minute, I'm saved by grace. You're talking about effort. Mm -hmm. Love what Dallas Willard says. Dallas Willard says grace delivers us from earning, mm -hmm. not from effort. Yeah, I love that. Because I, I, and that that is where people get tripped <clears throat> up on it is they think, okay, I'm saved by grace, I'm set, I'm good, and and, and they're like, I just have to just go through my life, and and I know that leads into a bigger conversation that we don't need to go into right now, but they don't put the effort forth, and, and you look at the effort that was put forth from these people in the Bible. And we are to model their example, model the example of Jesus and the effort that they, they did not receive this knowledge of Jesus and sit on it when, they, when the Holy Spirit fell. They went and provided effort and started to prophesy and do things on behalf of Jesus in that sphere. And I think that's what we're seeing so much is you think about the world today, how many Christians there are. There's 2.5 billion Christians, Christians, right. and you know, it's Christians that can be a loose term in, in some areas. 2.5. If that 2.5 was mobilized, do you realize how quick the let's say five? I don't, I don't know the exact number. Five billion rest would be converted and, and reached. Why is it not happening? It's because there's there's a lack of effort. Lack of effort. Yeah. That's okay. Cool. The word disciple, Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations. The word disciple, the actual meaning is pupil, a mm -hmm. learner. Yeah. Now, it also means that you closely follow the behavior of the one you're learning from. Mm -hmm. That's where follower comes from. When you say disciple, most people hear follower. It's not follower. It's actually pupil or learner. Yeah. So that means you have to expend effort. If I go to school and I expend no effort, I don't do any homework, I don't listen in class, I get nowhere. Yeah. I, you can have two people sitting in the same classroom. It can be a college, let's say, lecture hall. One person is daydreaming and getting nothing. The other person, they are getting the knowledge that's going to change their world. Now, in spirituality, in Christianity, I should say spirituality, in Christianity, it's the same way. Mm -hmm. We can get saved <clears throat> and sit there and not grow and keep being drawn back. My people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge mm -hmm. to the point that we get destroyed. My people get destroyed. They fall back into the sinful desires of the world. Mm. They don't add to their faith. They don't expend the effort to add to that faith, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> the Amplified Bible says it's so good. Employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop. Mm. Now we're coming to the seven things. Yep. So I'm going to say it one more time. Okay. Employ every effort in exercising your faith to develop. To develop what, Peter? Number one is a generous provision, he says, of moral excellence. Now, yeah. some translations say virtue, moral excellence. Yeah. Let's talk about that. That means excellence of character. It means exceptional civil virtue. Mm -hmm. It means to bring to maturity excellence or merit within a social context. So, yeah. in other words, you become a gentleman. Yeah. Now, that's the old... <clears throat> meaning of a gentleman, or you become a lady. That's the old understanding of what a lady is. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't understand that today in our society, but if you go back 100 years, if you said gentleman, you said a lady, people knew what you were talking about. This is what moral excellence means. It means you have a behavior that is like Christ. Mm -hmm. It is a behavior that glorifies God. It is a behavior that doesn't, that doesn't hurt God people yeah. it actually builds people yeah. it doesn't leave you where you were too like i love this definition is full realization of potential or inherent function wow like i love that like full if you realization yeah if you have a full realization of your potential and not this and this is the potential that god has given you you cannot sit idly by right like, and that's what i think we see so many people and why they wrestle with oh i got saved but now what am i supposed to do? what am i called to do what's this like dynamic that i'm going through it's because a lack of what they don't know what their calling is. You know, but really quick, because I'm, I'm sorry, say this, I think what people do is they get so hung up on what is my calling that they completely ignore their first calling, and that is to be a son Ooh. or a daughter Ooh. of God, which is realizing that full potential. So when I got my first computer, I opened it up. I was able to do a couple things, but yeah. then I sat down with the guy and I spent hours with him, and he started showing me. 
And the whole time I kept saying, I can do that. He said, you could have done it all along. You then he'd do, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> he'd do another thing. He'd do another thing. I go, I can do that? He goes, yeah, you could have done it all along. Yeah. I was realizing the full potential of the computer mm -hmm. that was right before me. Mm -hmm. So the potential's all there. Yeah. It just has to be worked out. Mm -hmm. And this is what Peter's talking about. Yeah. You have to expend effort to work out this moral excellence. Now, in the Roman and Greek societies, <clears throat> this word moral, for moral excellence, it's the Greek word arete. This word was used in a merit that was given to those who were distinguished for fidelity. Mm -hmm. Admirable character, uprightness. In other words, they had a concern for people and devotion to deity. Now, isn't that amazing? That was actually a word ascribed to somebody mm -hmm. who, what, excelled in moral excellence. Okay? Yeah. All right. So what do we add? What that, Number one is moral excellence. What's number two thing that God never wants us to forget? It's knowledge. Yeah. So he's saying, actually, you have to exert effort to gain knowledge because this knowledge is just a knowledge of God's word. Mm -hmm. it's, it's defining or comprehending something, right? It's defined as comprehending something on an intellectual level. Yeah. So you have to do what Paul said. You have to study to show yourself approved as a workman unto God. Yeah. I remember for me, like I had a you know, great foundation with you and mom. And I remember things in scripture and things in my walk with Christ did not become really real to me until I got some time away. I went, you know, went to a Bible school and I remember the Bible school was great, but the things that I actually learned the most and I grew in the knowledge was from my quiet time in the word where I just sat down and just began to go through the word and asking God, what, it, what are you saying here? And I remember I also got a, a, a Bible program called Logos and I was able to go through it and, and go into a deep dive of, okay, what's the context here? What's this? Like, God, what are you actually speaking through that? And I remember that time period was a solidifying of what I felt like the moral excellence in terms of the the perseverance and, and the the um, mm. the uh, realization of what my life was called to be was aligning within scripture because i think there's one thing of you can have the the realization for what my life to be but then yet i something i love that you have always prayed is you said god never allow my calling to out live or you can say outlive my character never or, allow what you've called me to do to exceed the character you've developed in me yeah and i feel like that comes through this the quiet place like the character development so, so something i noticed you said you were having conversation as you were reading the scripture see yeah. most people read the scripture just to get their reading done yeah i find that scripture is god talking to me mm -hmm. so i actually have a conversation too yeah you well, and I both do that. We, we, we literally talk to God while we read His Word. Hey everybody, spiritual growth doesn't happen by accident. That's why we here at Messenger International are passionate about equipping you with resources to help you grow in your relationship with God. One tool we hope you'll take advantage of is our free Messenger X app. Inside Messenger X, you'll get access to dozens of full-length courses, sermons, audiobooks, and more, all available to you at no cost. Whatever your goals, whether you're looking to discover your calling, develop deeper intimacy with God, find freedom, or improve your relationships, you'll find resources on Messenger X that will help you get there. Download Messenger X today, create your free account, and dive in. Now, back to the podcast. Like sometimes we do just do our, our reading and it's getting from here to here. And it's like, okay, I read one chapter today. It's like, no, sometimes I get so much more from the word where I take one verse, just the same thing with what we're doing with this, this podcast. I take one verse and I'm like, huh, his divine power has granted me, granted to us everything pertaining to life. God, God, what do you mean everything? What do you mean pertaining to life? Like, what does life look like? Like asking God these questions and meditating on that rather than just reading that and be like, okay, yeah, that's, that's really great. That's what God said to Joshua. If you meditate on this yeah. day and night, you will be successful and you will be prosperous. Mm -hmm. Paul said the same thing to Timothy. He said, give yourself entirely to what? The reading of the scripture. Mm -hmm. Meditate on it so that your progress will appear to all. Yeah. So again, it's working out our salvation. This is what Peter's talking about, working it out, right? 
So knowledge is number two. What's number three of the seven things God never wants us to forget? Self-control. Self-control. <clears throat> we had big a big one. discussion about this yesterday at lunch, didn't we? Yeah. Well, the difference between self-control and discipline. Yeah. It's it really the same thing, but in people's minds, it's different. Yeah. It means continence. It means to exercise complete control over one's desires, emotions, thoughts, impulses, yeah. and actions. In the Greek lexicon... I love this. I took it right from it. An adequate rendering of the expression to exercise self-control may be required, may require an idiomatic equivalent. This is what they said would be to hold oneself in, to command oneself, to be a chief to oneself, to make one's inner person be obedient, to command one's own desires to be the master of what one wants, to say no to one's body. Now, this is all straight from the Greek in in English lexicon. Now, you say, no. John, that sounds like works. That's not works. Self-control, or we would know it today as discipline, discipline. is a fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. In other words, as we exert effort in our knowledge, this fruit comes out of our spirit. We have the ability to exercise self-control. Now listen to what Proverbs 25, 28 yeah, says. That's what I was going to go to. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, read it. Go ahead. It says, it says a person without self-control is like a city with broken down walls. Okay. Now let's talk about this. Yeah. A city with broken down walls in the days of Solomon who wrote Proverbs mm -hmm. was a city that could be easily Taken. destroyed by yeah. the enemy. Mm -hmm. And the enemy could come in and go out whenever he wanted. Yeah. I mean, that's what the, the 10 spies go in, and what's like one of the key things they're looking for? Do their cities have walls? That was one of the they things. They had a that big wall. Right. Do, like, do, like, when you go in, are they right for the taking? Do they have walls? Like, that's one of the main things that they're looking for as they're spying on the enemy, seeing, okay, they don't have walls. How fortified are those walls? Yeah, it's easy are they to take easily them. broken down? Mm -hmm. but, but, but a person without self control, without this, it's like, it's like you got no walls. They're broken yeah. down. The enemy easily slips in. And I want you to think about this. Everybody that's not listening to this podcast right now, I want you to think about this. You find yourself saying, I just lost control. Well, you haven't developed self-control. Is this something that you arrive at one day? No, it's something that I'm continuing to do after walking with Jesus for 45 years. I don't believe when I'm 85, I'm going to say, I arrived at self-control. Yeah. But I am pressing towards it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wanting every single day my behavior to become more and more disciplined or to have self-control mm -hmm. because why? I'm going to meet up with situations that are going to be disappointing, different than what I expected, and how I respond to those is going to be determined by have I developed the fruit of self-control. Yeah. Here, here's what I suddenly realized today as I was preparing for this podcast. I think Christians are looking for a cladic, many Christians, excuse me, are looking for a, a climatic or almost um, crisis situation where everything changes, mm -hmm. an instantaneous change. This is not. Jesus mm -hmm. said the whole kingdom of God's like you plant seed in the ground, you sleep yeah. by night, you rise by day, it grows up, you don't even know how it's growing. Yeah. Well, and, and there's <clears throat> some plants that it will happen, but you have to plant in the ground, and it, sometimes it takes time, and it's like one day, like we, I know we just planted some plants, and it's like one day I'm like, there, that thing is dead, not coming back. <laughs> and then I come out there two days later, and it's it's grown, it's grown three feet. And then there's some plants that it's a slow progression, and it's just slowly growing over time. So I want everybody to get this image. As a boy, we used to have a lot of cornfields, okay. Mm -hmm. And I remember like those cornfields, we'd drive by it, and they were about ankle high. Yeah. They were just like stubs coming out of the brown, and then. A month and a half later, we drove that same route to go somewhere, and all of a sudden I thought, whoa, they're waist high. Mm -hmm. I saw the growth in a month and a half. Now, yep. if I sat there day in and day out and day in and day out and never left that cornfield, I'd never see them growing. Mm -hmm. This is our Christian life. We get up. We get into the Word. All of a sudden now, Paul says in Thessalonians, the Word of God actually works in us. Mm -hmm. It's alive. It's yeah. powerful. It actually is transforming us. Yeah. But we don't know how. 
And if you sit there and just watch yourself day and night and day and night, you're not going to see any growth. But if you are, are doing this day and night and I leave for two months and then I come back, yeah. this is what happened when you went to Bible school. Yeah. You left for nine months and you came Ten back and Lisa yeah. and I looked at each other and said, he's not the same man. Mm -hmm. He is a man. And I remember actually having that conversation. His mom kept telling me, she said, you can't come back. Like nothing's changed. And I said, mom, I know nothing's changed but I have changed. And that was the one thing that needed to change. I remember having that conversation. That's she was such like, a good statement. Okay, you can come back. I was like, that is okay. such a good statement. Yeah. Wow. Because before I left, I thought everything else was the problem. And then I went away and spent quiet time with God. And I realized, no, the thing that needed to grow was me. Wow. Yeah. All it, right. Go ahead. Go ahead. We, we got to keep going probably. All right. These. So we're exerting effort yep. to develop. Okay. First one is moral excellence. Moral Second excellence. one is knowledge. knowledge. Third one is self-control. What's the next one? Perseverance. Or patient endurance. Yeah. It means the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about that. I love this one. Yeah. It remain, It means to remain under. A bearing up under, capacity to continue to bear up under, difficult circumstances, persevere. Hey, everybody's going to relate to this. It's like endurance training. Yeah. I have a friend who has done quite well in the Ironman competition. What is Ironman? It's two miles swimming, 26 miles bike, and, or 26 miles running, and 100 miles bike riding. You do that all in one. It's insanity. It's That's in, what it yeah. is. <laughs> so he has to do endurance yeah. training. Yeah. And <clears throat> this is what has to be done in the spirit. Now, Paul, Paul said bodily exercise profits a little. In other words, mm -hmm. it's good for you. What he did to train for that Ironman is good. Yeah. But what it means is, it profits little. It means it's only good for this life. But godliness is profitable, he, his next statement, to eternal life. Mm -hmm. So in other words, this kind of training that we're doing, this endurance training is spiritually developing, making every effort, just like he made effort. He got up in the morning. He ate the right things. He slept the right amount of hours. He went out and did the amount of running and swimming and biking to prepare for the Ironman. Yeah. We're doing the same thing spiritually. Yeah. It takes effort. Okay, we're getting up, we're spending time with God. Yeah. We, I mean, I we, mean when, and when you look at the perspective of that, is like you're accomplishing that race in one day, but the, you probably trained for six months. Months and months and months. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's the amazing thing, because people, people want to be persevering. Yeah. So everybody wants to be Billy Graham yeah. in one day. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the mentality of so many people. Yep. And social media might make you feel like that yeah. in one day. <laughs> Just being honest. <laughs> like, okay. I'm going to be like Billy Graham in one day. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's a lifetime right there of a man who got up every single morning, prayed and spent time in the word of God. Yeah. And he grew and grew and grew. And we see the big corn stalk and we go, yeah. well, that's what I'm going to be. Yeah. That's what God's given me. No, mm -hmm. you've got to expend effort to get there. Yeah. Well, and then also too, I love the idea of he knows the confidence in his body. So the man who's training for the Iron Man is that it's not that he gets into the Iron Man and it's like, this is a breeze. I just, I trained six months for this, a year for this. This is so easy. No, but over that six months to a year, he has tested his limits and he knows where he can push himself. And so that when he's in that and he's on the 25th mile of the bikes or however many miles that he's having to go through, he knows, okay, my body right now is telling me I'm weak, but I know it has more. And that's the same thing for our spirit because I see too many people that are quitting way too early. And why? It's because they've not tested the limits of what God has given them through the quiet time that they have spending with God so that they know I am under attack, I am under pressure, I am feeling the weight of the world. And instead of speaking to themselves and saying, God, no, you've given me so much more. Like I know how far God's grace, I know God's grace is sufficient for me because his power is made best in my weakness. Like that's what I that's love so about good. that because it's not a, that it's an absence of it won't be challenging. It's still gonna be challenging. Yeah. But he knows what his body can get through. Okay, so think about the Apostle Paul, his endurance, or Peter, his mm -hmm. endurance. Paul said, I was whipped with, I mean, their whips had lead tips on them. Yeah. It had broken bones on it. Yeah. Five, he, he said, five times I was whipped with 39 lashes. Five times. Yeah. Okay, he's in dungeons. He is beaten with rods three mm -hmm. times. Three times beaten with rods. Literally, they would bruise your bones. You'd be in excruciating pain in your bones yeah. for six to eight weeks. Can you imagine? Because it's worse to get a bruised bone than a broken bone sometimes. 
Like it, it hurts. Oh, I longer. know. I bruise the bone. You break twice a bone, and it's and like I you never s- want to do it yeah. again. Yeah, yeah okay. but bruising a bone can be painful. He was stoned. He was shipwrecked. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's Paul. That's what he had to endure under. He stayed constant in those situations, right? Ours is social media, Mm -hmm. mainstream media, the craziness of our society. Ours has a totally different form, but it's just as wicked and destroying as what Paul was going through. Actually, I have had people that have come from overseas and said they believe that this nation, the United States, is the hardest nation to serve God in on, in the planet. Mm. And they said, because you have no persecution, you have luxury, leisure, and pleasure, so yeah. you don't have to fight, fight in the way we have to fight. The problem is our fighting is seductive. Mm. And so we've got to remain constant when everybody's running out to do this. I remember I was talking to Clark Kellogg. Clark does the you know Final Four every single year. He's the announcer. Hmm. And Clark is a very devoted believer. And he said, John, it is so hard to do this job. Now, he's done it every year. But he looked at me and he said, because the, 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 the parties and, and what these guys do, He said, I just have to stay. I stay in my hotel room and read my Bible. And I thought, okay, that's endurance. Mm -hmm. It's a different form than being beaten or stoned. He's got to be able to say no to all this pressure to come to these parties and engage in the lewd behavior. So number four is patient endurance. So number one, moral excellence. Number two is knowledge. Number three is is discipline or self-control. Number four is endurance. What's number five? It's my favorite. And I can't believe, I don't even know how long we've gone. (laughs) We're so far over time, but I don't care. Number five is godliness, which is the Greek word that means the fear of the Lord. It means reverence towards God or piety. It means we fear God. This is what Jesus delighted in. Because why? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowing God intimately. Proverbs 1, verse 7, Proverbs 2, verse 5 tells us the starting place of knowing God. Remember, all of this power comes to us by knowing him, yeah. right? Is the fear of the Lord. That's why Jesus delighted in it. And can I even take it, just as you were saying that, I think take it even another step, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but what's the other definition of the fear of God? It's fear of God is the beginning of what? Wisdom. Wisdom. And I look at this is like, I've always seen the progression of knowledge versus wisdom. And what is wisdom versus knowledge? Wisdom is how do you take knowledge and apply it to your life? Oh, that's so good. And I think that's what the fear of God does it. Because you can have a lot of people that are, uh, you're really smart. You know the Bible really well. Why is it not that's being, practically not being worked yeah, out? Why is it not actually being applied to your life? And it's because they lack the fear of God. Because it gives you wisdom to be able to apply. Like I've always said it is knowledge is basically a home. Like knowledge is a home, you have the building, like you have a building, you have structure, but yet the wisdom is the life that happens within the home. It is is the things that make a home a home. And it's like, you can have the structure, you can have the the thing of a house, but you walk in and you really quickly will be aware, there's no furniture in here. There's there's no life in here. And without wisdom, you can't have that life happening. And so I've always seen it as that way. And I think those are connecting Yeah, when I walk into your Christian's home, I'm uh, just yeah. amazed. I mean, the way you two have made that place so absolutely gorgeous, such a small yeah. home, but you've made it look like an absolute amazing yeah. embassy or castle. Yeah. It's just so beautiful. That was your, that was the wisdom that you guys had to make it, how, to how, how the flow of that home goes. You're mm-hmm. constantly thinking, how can we improve this for our children? Mm-hmm. I just love that. And I'm so proud of you for that. <laughs> okay. I need to say that as a dad. Yeah. But anyway, I look okay. at the fear of the Lord and everybody's going, wait a minute, what, what is the fear of the Lord? It's not to be scared of God because you can't be intimate with somebody you're scared of. Mm-hmm. It's actually being scared of being away from God. It's yeah. when we reverence, stand in awe of him, revere him to the degree that he deserves. Yeah. And nobody will ever hit that total degree that he deserves because he deserves so much more honor, respect, awe, trembling than what we give him. But that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's when we, this is why Jesus delighted in it. Mm -hmm. This is the fear of the Lord gives us the staying power. It gives us the ability not to quit. It was Jesus's fear of the Lord that caused him to sweat drops of blood in that garden, yet still 
fulfill what his father called him to do, even when he knew he can call 2,000 angels to deliver him. He said, nope, this is what my father wants. I'm going to endure this. So the fear of the Lord is what what? gives you the ability to do the endurance that we just talked about. Yeah. And so it is so important. I wrote an entire book on this, actually two entire books, <laughs> but the most recent is called The Awe of God, A-W-E of God. And I'm going to say this, guys, if you have not read that book, I'm not saying this because I wrote it, but it has been a bestseller for over a year, yeah. a, a, a number one bestseller for over a year with mm-hmm. Amazon. I know it, it, yeah. I see it go in and out. Well, Constantly. Can I say a quick testimony onto that? Is yeah. that I was talking to a guy, he texted me today, um, and he navigated fear so much on a significant degree. And he knew what the Bible talked about in fear. And it was more, you know, it was worldly fear. And he was navigating this. And it's amazing because he got a hold of your book and he said, For the first time, I don't battle with fear. Oh, and he gosh. said, because he's new so long oh. of what it said. And I just wanted to take that more to a practical and showing what it applies into your life. So when he understood the healthy fear of God, it was like all the things connected. And that wisdom took place. And he's like, my knowledge now makes sense. This is the only generation, the only generation ever in the church history that our leaders have not taught the fear of the Lord delivers us from all other fears. Yeah. We've got to start telling people yeah. this and I because believe fear is literally the way our society is operating. Yeah. This this uh, cancel culture, this um, social media, social it's, media, it's everything. It's, it's so much fear, and yeah. the fear of man has I, at an all time high. Mm-hmm. I'm 65 years old, and yet I've never seen fear at a greater. Yeah. The, the 64 million people in America say the number one thing they're fighting. Excuse me, 164 million people in America say the number one thing they're fighting is fear and anxiety. So it's it's a real issue. So please read the All of God book to get more into that. Number six. So number one, moral excellence. Number two is knowledge. Number three, self-control. Number four is perseverance. Number five is the fear of healthy fear of God. Number six is brotherly affection. This is the Greek word Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. This means affectionate love. This means kindness. A Christian is kind. A Christian is not rude. Mm -hmm. A Christian is kind. A Christian cares about people. A a Christian, somebody who's truly Christ-like, is out to better people's lives. Now, to better somebody's life doesn't mean you give them what they want. It means you give them what they need Mm -hmm. to grow into healthy. Right now, our society thinks to better somebody, you give them what destroys them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not just being—it's not just being nice to someone. Like I do. I'm sorry, I shouldn't even be no, laughing. It's I, so, it's I so agree. S- like the the thing that I actually just picking up on this is brotherly kindness. Like I look at my brothers, th- that brotherly kindness was not always just telling me what I wanted to hear. Like yeah. that's that's not how we operated. Sometimes it was tough. Sometimes it was we wrestled. But at the end of the day, we always loved each other and was unified into that. And so. It does not just mean being nice to everyone. And I think that's what people take it as for. And that's they're like, oh, you're not being kind. So you're not being godly. It's like, no, I'm, I'm telling you, honestly, the things that are going to help save your life. And if I was not telling you that, that would not be kindness. And so I do think we need to see it in that greater manner. So we were talking about it the other day and, and saying how uh, you never find children that at the time say, I wish my dad wasn't, you know. At so, the time you ask yeah. them when they're children? Yeah, wasn't saying. so corrective with me. But then when they grow older, they always look back on that and they say, I, I'm so glad that my dad was corrective with me and was able, and of course in a loving way and doing it in the correct way, but was able to tell me, no, this is wrong. This is the way that you're supposed to do it. Instead of just being their friend, their buddy and loving them through like, no, they, they, they were there for their life to be able to instruct them and take them down the right way. Okay, what would number seven be? What never fails, love, love. never fails. Yeah. That word love is agape, and it is the God kind of love. It is where we literally lay our lives down for one another. Now, yeah. I think it's really mm-hmm. interesting that Peter n- lists kindness, which is a Philadelphia, which is affectionate love, which, by the way, the world has that. Mm-hmm. The world has affectionate love. Agape love is the, wor- is the love that Jesus said the world cannot receive yeah so that love is a love that's only found when the holy spirit sheds abroad abroad in a born again believer's heart that is a love that the world longs for and doesn't know where to find it and that's what we're supposed to do is tell them where to find it how to find a love that will lay its life down for you and has already laid 
yeah. his life down for you. And notice I said his because love is a person. God is love. Now, the thing is, we have so perverted love today in our society. We say, you love me if you give me what I want. Yeah. You love me if you affirm what I like that is destroying me. This is the love of God, the Bible says, that we keep his commandments. Yeah. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. So this is the core of love. Yeah. Because knowing that God knows what's best for me, and if I do what's best for me, it's going to turn out better in the yeah. long run. Yeah. Whereas the world says, no, I know what's best for me, and I'm going to do this. And what happens is you get suicides, you get people in depression, you get yeah. people that regrets. You never have regrets when it comes yeah. to God. Well, I mean, John 15, laying down, you know, what greater love is there than to lay down one's life for a friend? Yep. Right there, like Jesus' whole sacrifice, our understanding of love, Jesus' whole sacrifice was what? To forgive us and to set us free from the things that would ultimately keep us bonded. And so if we're saying, I, it's my role to show love to this world, and so that means I'm supposed to just accept everyone, that's not, that's not the love. That was not the love that was shown on that cross. Not at all. He died for what was best for us. Yeah. Wow. To bring us back to our creator. Yeah. God is love. He doesn't have love. He is yeah. love. Mm -hmm. Now, these are the seven things. These are the seven things that God never wants us to forget. Yeah. And in the next podcast, we're going to find out the result of never forgetting the seven things that God never wants us to forget. And the results are crazy amazing. So... I just feel right now that there are people, Arden, that are watching and or listening, watching. You have felt very unloved. You've felt very insignificant. And yet, as you're listening to these words, you feel almost like a stirring on the deep inside of you. That's the Holy Spirit drawing you back to your creator. I just, I want to appeal to you right now. God is not angry at you. He's not mad at you. Now, don't get me wrong. You're under God's wrath if you have not received Jesus Christ as your Lord. That is something our Father put us under. Adam and Eve put us under the wrath of God when they disobeyed God in a perfect environment. However, God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die for you before you ever even had this desire that you feel right now. And so all God's asking for is not for your perfect behavior. God is asking for your full heart. He's asking you nothing less than what a spouse asks. A spouse says, I just want you to be faithful to me and not be an adulterer. God says that my relationship with you is no different than a husband and a wife. When a woman walks down an aisle of a church, she's actually communicating something significant. She's saying goodbye to about 3.9 billion guys. She's saying this is the one and only man I'm giving the rest of my life to. Does it make her perfect the first day, the week, the year? It just means she's given her complete, total heart to that one man. This is what God asks of you. He doesn't ask for perfect behavior. He doesn't ask for you to come bringing all your good works. He's asking for your heart. He is the one that will change you, and your works will become glorifying to him. This is what you're sensing right now. I want to lead you in a prayer. You have to realize you have been living your way. You've been living out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I decide what's good for me. When you come to Jesus, you lay down that and you say, "You, I know you know what's best for me. Therefore, I will serve you and follow you all the days of my life. And no matter what you tell me, I will believe it and I will obey it and I will act on it. And so if you can say, that's all you have to say is I'll give you my full heart, my full devotion, my full life then pray this with us right now. Just say this, Father in heaven, O oh God in heaven, forgive me for living my way apart from you, my creator. But this very day, this very moment, I give my full spirit, soul, and body, everything I am and everything I have to you, Lord Jesus. Jesus, you are now my king, my Lord, my husband forever. I give my life fully to you, in Jesus' name. Now, I really sense the presence of God right now on you. And so I'm going to ask God to fill you with his spirit. Father, I'm asking right now that you would fill my brother, my sister, whoever's listening to me right now, that you would fill them with your presence. Fill them with your spirit. Manifest the presence of Jesus 
right now in their life. I see you being healed right now. I see some of you being delivered right now, supernaturally by the power of God. It's happening right now. I see you being set free from what you couldn't walk away from. Now you're going to notice the desire is gone. He's taken it away. There's other things he's going to have you grow in, as we've been talking about in this program. But there are some of you right now, instantly, God is freeing you from the desires of things. Lord, I just thank you for this right now. That's his presence. That's his power. Baptize them in your Holy Spirit of fear, of wisdom, of might, of knowledge, of understanding, and of counsel. And most of all, the Spirit of the Lord God. May he rest upon you and fill you completely in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Till next time, this has been the John Bevere Podcast with Arden Bevere and John Bevere. <laughs>